Welcome to the Total Connected Show. My name is Kevin Devani. This is a very spontaneously emerging discussion with Eric Vasquez and Ben Kaufman. Uh, just to, uh, think, uh, welcome to my show, uh, Eric and Ben, again. Um, since we already know who Eric is, Ben, would you introduce yourself a little bit? Um, sure, yeah. So I'm a software developer, um, mostly interested in Bitcoin. I started learning about Austrian economics from that and just focusing on, yeah, on software development in space, um, mostly with I try to uh, do some development mostly on Beast um, and also try to write a little in, in the Austrian tradition uh, about Bitcoin and general monetary theory. So you're into Austrian economics uh, essentially too? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so I've been following your discussion. I find it highly fascinating. I do think it is you know, uh, not just trivial discussion, it's, it's uh, really goes to that. What, what's, what's the, the discussion we've been, you know, uh, we've been following and just commenting once in there. What did it, why, why did this discussion start of anyway? Did it start with this, uh, with a comment of uh, the uh, Twitter, with its Twitter handle, Jurevic, or? No. What, what's the? No, it, it started with a, with a, the long rant about uh, how, Bitcoin used to be a money, and now it's a uh, whatever you whatever he said. I don't know. It goes it goes back a little further. Further down. I just retweeted. I, I, no, you got to go way up. We got to go way up. Well, uh... Yeah, it's, it's, it's up like 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. Oh, I can't go. I think, I, I think, I think at some point the whole point of the thing got lost. Is it here? The real benefits? No, keep, keep, no. keep, keep, keep going up. I can't go up anymore. Well, why can't go up? Okay, I can't go up. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I think I'm here. Can you go up, find go up to your top? Let's go up to your top. Yeah. Okay. That was in response to. Yeah, that was in response to a thread that was. I don't know. This is not that important. It was. It was a. It was, I can find it for you if you want. I thought it was. It started with off with the speculations. Speculations what gets people's attention. No, it was, it was early this morning. I'm like. But yet, if they use the money as a money, or maybe fail to remain whole coiners, there's something wrong with them. Can't find it. Um, yeah, I guess this was a related thread too. When this is, it's probably you. You did have the right top there. It was a. There was a related thread this morning, and I think they were. They're just not linked. It's two separate posts. Okay, so what what are the questions at the center of the discussion, uh, uh, Ben, Eric? First, I want to understand what the question is. What is the question? Well, I think I think this started off with was this Gravik? I don't I don't know who that is, um, but I've seen him post and um, you know just just commenting that um, that the that the uh, early Bitcoiners um, you know sold out too early and and. Uh, uh, it was a no-brainer trade to to buy Bitcoin at you know some early price, and, and I think I just just commented that you know it's a money and you know the current price is the is the right price and using the money is perfectly rational. Then we got into talking about how uh, you know how saving the money is is much better and and um, then discussing what the difference between saving 
the distinctions between uh, hoarding and investing are and you know which one is relevant to time preference and then somebody chimed in on which one's better and you know i i'm not i've never made any comments here on which one is better um just i personally just trying to draw the proper distinctions between these things because people tend to consider hoarding bitcoin as okay. an expression of in investing in low time preference which is incorrect um but anyway that's that's where it all Okay. Well, what is the distinction? What is the distinction, Eric? I mean, can you recapitulate that? I mean, what what is the well, uh, misconception that, it, obviously, in your okay, these are these are in some ways terminological issues, right? Like if you have a word like or a term like time preference, you have to have a definition for it, right? And and in the definitions or the explanations of time preference, it's clearly expressed that time preference is expressed as the interest rate. Right? The, the global rate of return on capital, um, which means that no amount of hoarding in, in affects time you know, uh, increases, or I'm sorry, no, increased hoarding could not possibly indicate a lower time preference, right? It's just the opposite. It's all about lending, investing. So, um, well, that, but that depends on if it comes instead of, uh, or if, if the hoarding comes instead of lending and investing or instead of spending. That's there's so no funny. distinction. There's there's no distinction. You either you either have stuff or you lent stuff to somebody. The stuff you have is the stuff you spent on. Um, spending is an is an action, but what you what you have versus what you've lent is is the ratio of your cap your your hoarded capital to your lent capital, and that is the interest rate. And that's clearly expressed by any definition I've ever seen in Austrian economics. The interest rate is the expression of hoarding and it is the ratio of hoarded capital to lent capital. But there's still, so, um, very, yeah, but there's still when you save Bitcoin or when you save cash balances, it still um, both uh, allows for other, uh, others to use the capital, the available capital in the economy, the available resources, and it increases the value um, of, the, uh, of other people's money. That's still no. more time preference that, than spending. No. Holding, holding anything is an, is an expression of higher time preference than lending. And the measure of time preference is the interest rate. Holding Bitcoin versus holding you know, cats, dogs, cars, and houses uh, doesn't make any difference. You're still holding them. No, so yeah, but Crawford doesn't. I know that many people have it, claimed. It has been seen in, in Austrian economics before. So there is a distinction between holding cash balances and holding cats, dogs, whatever, because cash balances okay, allow so others to cash. Holding holding money that has no has does not uh, lower the interest rate, <laughs> so it cannot possibly have any uh, bearing on time preference. Uh, it cannot lower time preference. Holding money versus holding a car, that's just not the case. Um, the the t time preference is expressed as the interest rate. The interest rate goes down the more people lend, invest. It's also the same number. It's expressed as the ratio of your of your of your hoarded capital of your lent capital to your hoarded capital. So um, you know, uh, it's just a definition, right? It's the meaning of it, and the only way I could, I guess, prove it to you is go to the people who wrote down the definitions, which is, you know, it's very clearly expressed by Rothbard, who's probably the most clearest writer on the subject. Um, many people have claimed that holding money is an expression of low time preference. That's just nonsense. Holding money means you want it now versus later. <laughs> um, just like holding any asset and all assets depreciate when you hold them. That depreciation is consumption. Buying is not consumption. Buying is just a, an asset changing hands. It's not being consumed until it depreciates. So if you buy a car and then you sell it the next day, it hasn't been consumed. It's just changed hands. It's consumed as you hold it, just like everything. Um, it's the lending that expresses the desire to have something later versus now. And that's how you capture time value, and that's why it's called time preference. The fact that um, an asset may appreciate in price while you're holding it is not an expression of investment return. It's an, it's an expression of a speculative return. Um, and anything can change in price. Cars, you know, 
houses, um, holding them is not an indication that you have low time preference. You hold them. And that is decoupled from the monetary phenomenon of Bitcoin? I mean, you're, you're saying a Bitcoin is not a monetary what, what, phenomenon. Is that what you're what saying? What phenomenon are we talking about? What do you mean by monetary phenomenon? Well, because it's something new, it's, it's, it's unprecedented. That's what I'm saying. Is it, you mean it's like a totally strict principle, whatever you are defining it's or- It's just a definition. I mean, it's, an, it's a, it's a well-established uh, principle. What it means is mm -hmm. um, people, pr people prefer their stuff now uh, more than later, right? So they, okay. they have a preference for things now more than later. Having your money now versus getting it later is the same expression. Um, and people want their money now because they presumably want to be able to spend it. They're, they're, they have a certain risk tolerance. They want to have their car now. They want to have their house now. They want to actually have possession of the stuff. That's an expression of higher time preference. If you have a lower time preference, you don't want it as much now. You're willing to lend it to somebody else and get, get some later, get some more later. And that more is the interest rate, right? That's what you're, that's what you're willing to lend at. So, the idea that holding some asset in your physical possession is an expression of low time preference is just completely backwards. Whether the asset appreciates or not is irrelevant. All assets can potentially appreciate or depreciate. It's not consumed until you're holding it, right? This is another, this is a commonly held economic error that's, it's not inherent in time, in, in time preference. It's just a general economic error that buying something is consumption. Buying something is not consumption, right? Buying, buying something is just changing hands. It's not consumed until it's destroyed, which should be pretty obvious from the word consumption, right? You buy some food, you haven't consumed it, right? It's not consumption until you eat it, right? And when you eat it, you still have to consume the energy in the food until you expend it, and now it's fully destroyed. It's the same, same with anything else. It just changes hands. You know, a, a car in, in the manufacturer's inventory is depreciating while it's in his inventory, right? It's being consumed. When it changes hands, it continues to be consumed. So this idea of selling being consumption is part of the reason why people make this error with respect to time preference. They think buying things is the expression of high time preference, actually holding them, which is when they depreciate. So Ben, what's, uh, uh, can you recapitulate your arguments? What you... Yeah, so I, I definitely see what, he, what Eric is saying about time preference and how it is represented merely by, um, by the interest rate. Um, but I still, so one thing is that I still think that if you hold Bitcoin or if you hold cash balances, you still, um, it's, it is still a lower time preference than activity than holding anything else, which is not cash, as you allow for others to use their cash, which gets higher value. So that's first. I don't, want, the second thing, I don't understand what you mean by allowing others. So what when, does it mean by allowing others? So when you're holding cash balances, you, the, uh, it's like you're just not, when you don't spend them, the value of the cash simply appreciates. The value of all other cash is appreciating. That's just not true. I mean, everybody always holds all money. I mean, there's all money is always held by somebody. It doesn't make yes, it just it, go up. It ma its velocity does matter. It's um, if you're an Austrian, I think you does matter. If, if you're an Austrian, I think you should probably revisit that idea of velocity of money. You'll find it's widely no, I rejected. Don't I, I don't like <laughs> velocity of money in the in the common it's, sense, but there is there is a, use for it. I, I don't like the term. I agree that's a bad term usually, but it, there is very, it is important for the value of money still. Even Rothbard talks about it in some sense. It's, it's still important. I mean, it's still important What's for important the value is, of money itself. Well, I mean, this is completely orthogonal to the question of time preference, but the speed that money moves is not what determines its value. And that's a, that's a tautology that, that Austrians have disproved uh, for quite a long time. Yeah, and, and, and the velocity uh, aspect, uh, didn't it come from Keynes, you know, this whole Keynesianism that uh, 
they try to you know uh, uh, no. make this a dogmatic it's older principle, than that. like a aggregate spending, aggregate, you know, like uh, velocity. All these terms that it come is all comes from Keynesians, right? I mean, no, it doesn't originate there. It's older than no. that. It comes from a long-standing attempt to determine what's the value of money, um, and you know this this idea that you know the it, it, basically the the, the the velocity of money uh, is a tautology. It says the, the that money determines the value of money. Um, so, no, so, but it, but it I, predates I mean, Keynes. Not I'm not a historian, but I know it's older than that. Yeah, but that's not exactly how I meant it. So what I mean is that basically when people try to lower their cash balances, they try to spend more. This causes money to depreciate when they try to spend more and lower the cash their cash balances. Okay. All right, let, let's just let's just take that as an assumption. Um, it has nothing to do with time preference, right? It, it, you can buy and sell stuff from other people, but you're not expressing time preference in any way, and neither are they. Not until you lend it. Each person is getting stuff now. <laughs> they have stuff now, and they're and they're trading it with stuff that other people have now. Whether it's money, cars, you know, houses, it doesn't. You know, money, money is still stuff, right? It's it, the it ha, it cannot change the interest rate unless you're lending, and the interest rate is the expression of time preference. That's just the that's the concept of time preference. I mean, I'll pull up a definition for you. No, yeah, I see your point. But so, yeah, on that point, I guess I agree with you that this is not exactly related to time preference per se. Um, but another thing here in the discussion, uh, which I think I want to talk about, um, is the basically the development of Bitcoin. So right now, how are you basically supposed to invest using Bitcoin? You don't have to invest using Bitcoin. I mean, I don't know where that idea comes from. I'm just <laughs> question. It, you know, if people can invest, they can invest all kinds of things. If they want to lend their Bitcoin, they can certainly lend their Bitcoin. If they want to cash it out, get some dollars, and lend their dollars, they can certainly do that too. Okay, but how? Does I mean, how do you buy anything? How do you Bitcoin? buy anything with Bitcoin? The vast majority of stuff that's bought with Bitcoin is actually converted to dollars and purchased with dollars or euro or whatever. It's no different with lending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm talking about how it does it help to the growth of Bitcoin. So what will help Bitcoin basically grow in size? How does it help the growth? I mean, the growth of Bitcoin is a consequence of people demanding goods in Bitcoin. So if they want, if they need Bitcoin to get things, that's what creates the demand. And people that, speculate on that demand. Well, then the, the question it, is, how, so do you, how do you increase demand then? Okay, then how do you... What, what's, how do you increase demand what, what for things represents the demand? In, Things that can, things that are purchased in Bitcoin that people would prefer to purchase in Bitcoin will increase the demand for Bitcoin. People holding Bitcoin in expectation of that demand don't increase the demand. People selling it in expectation that the demand is is not materializing don't decrease the demand. The demand is and this is a, again another well established um, Austrian concept that speculation does not determine price. It only guesses above and below the price, not even helping it get there any faster because speculation is guessing only the people who are actually using the thing get to determine what it's worth people who are trading for it you know because they want it so um the only way that happens is if people do it right if people if people want to use the money as a money they'll they'll do so and it'll it'll have that value um, and people will speculate on that value and it'll fluctuate widely but everything gets speculated on but that well, speculation so always is is not is non-determinative of the value uh, ultimately right so the question is where does that value come from well bitcoin has a value proposition it allows people to do things more easily than um, and more cheaply than they can do with other monies so it's those things that need to grow if we expect bitcoin to reach the value that people have speculated on Well, so what are, what are the person to say? Hmm? Sorry? I'm sorry, what are, I didn't hear you. Oh, so what I was, what I'm saying is that the, what's important for the demand for Bitcoin, what represents the demand for Bitcoin is not just how many people accept it, 
but how many people want it as their cash balances, basically to hold it. Uh, like anything, yeah. like cars. If, if you the demand for cars is how many people want to have cars. The demand for Bitcoin is how many people want to have Bitcoin. No, that's not that's not true. People want to have cars because they use them to drive to work. You can't drive Bitcoin to work. You can't eat it. You can't yeah, you but, can't sleep but, on but it. That, you can't live that, in it. That doesn't right? that doesn't represent the demand no, for it. There is no it has reason, no use like, value. Yes, it has no use value. Matters, this is why this is. This is why economists tried for a long time to figure out what determines the value of something with no use value, right? What's the monetary value? The monetary value is being able to exchange it for something of use value, right? And so people can hold it, but that holding is only an expectation of being able to trade it for something of use value, right? That, that's right. the only possible right. that, benefit you can get from holding it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that holding it by itself is not a dead demand for it. So if if you have like it doesn't matter that I why I want a car it doesn't matter if I want to sleep in it to drive in it or do whatever like that doesn't matter why I want it what's important for the demand for car for the car seller is that I want it that I have demand for it I want to possess it and the same applies for Bitcoin if I want to hold Bitcoin so, so demand for it if nobody if nobody can trade their Bitcoin for anything, then that desire to hold it will turn out to be um, pretty useless. Right? Uh, the car, probably somebody can get some use out of. But unless you can trade that Bitcoin for something of use, right, something of better use than, say, do the dollars could get you, then it's not got that value. Oh, yes, but, and that, but that expectation is ill-founded. Yeah, develop but, but, into, yeah, the, only yeah, but, into its actual utility. But the reality is, it's it's already being uh, uh, exchanged for uh, you know for for goods and services yeah. already, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the reality. It's, it is already used as a medium of exchange. Uh, maybe not you know not dominantly anywhere you can't see, but you know, cars being sold, uh, real estate is being sold. Uh, so it's being even loaned out, uh, right, with interest rates. Uh, mm -hmm. So so there's a process yeah, already and, going on, you know. There's another aspect yes. of Bitcoin, though, that's just being ignored, right? Bitcoin's value proposition is not in, you know, trading on big exchanges for dollars, right? That's, that's not a value prop. The value proposition is that it can, it can be used without permission. Right? It's permissionless, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't uh, accept supply changes, for example. These are, as I've said many times, black market concepts. These are things that can be easily taken away with white market use. So everything we're talking about for the most part is the growth of speculation on use that's largely not based on the Bitcoin value proposition, right? So when you look at actual black market activity in Bitcoin, um, you have actual use cases, right? Um, but, you know, you know, taking it and putting it in your web wallet and, you know, trading it for dollars on some online exchange um, isn't really building Bitcoin. Right? It's, it's just building a house of cards. So ultimately, if people want, want to see the value realized that they expect, they have to assume that it's going to be used the way it's designed, which is to operate without permission. Right now, it largely operates with permission. Right. So not only a lot of centralized services, but a lot of predominantly white market services. So, you know, people don't want to hear that because they put their own expectations on it. But these are not the expectations that are built into the design, the security model or any aspect of it. These are just people's desire to make money in this casino. Right. Um, because honestly, there's there's there's. There's, there's just not a there's not a value proposition in most of the things that it's that's being done with Bitcoin that are being done. Well, the people in the Bitcoin community they do they do exchange they do already you know uh, do uh, you know they do pay with Bitcoin. Uh, there's a lot of people in the Bitcoin scene or community uh, unless they're you know they have to pay the bills and the existential stuff. They yeah they you know they have to convert they have to hold some stash of dollars or whatever fiat. Um, so in the expectation, within the expectation that it is emerging as a medium of exchange with our, uh, let's just, yeah, let's just say uh, permissionless, 
uh, bl black market. Um, isn't that is that also is that also not the uh, you know a legitimate um, expectation of the value uh, rising in Bitcoin? I mean, I don't know what I'm mixing up something, but do you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> Sorry, you lost me. I do my best to yeah, fill so in the gaps, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, you were talking about the black market. I mean, it's already being used as a, as a, as an, as yeah, a. Yeah, well, I'm not. I haven't suggested it's not being used. We were talking about what it's, you know. So there's this condemnation of, of people that actually used it as a money or sold out, right? There, I mean, it's like the, the, using this metaphorical sellout as if it's a literal, you know, I, I sold my Bitcoin. Now, of course, somebody bought it, right? There was a trade. So it's not clear how this is a negative and how the person was stupid for using it or somehow wrong for using it when in fact it's a money, right? Um, they should have just held it because they should have known it would be, you know, worth so much more. And of course, it wouldn't be worth anything if people just held it. So it, 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 the theory is, is just what bothers me, that this idea that this, this thing, everybody should just hold on to. If it's not used well, as a money in a way that, that's consistent with the value proposition, that speculation will be for nothing. Well, it's not just holding it. It's, what's important is the demand for holding it. So when you want to hold it, you are willing to accept it, basically. And that's what can drive the actual use of it as a medium of exchange. But you need people to want it, to have the demand for it, want to hold it. Well, that is the case with a money being used in trade. People want it. That's why they accept it. Yes. But now, because Bitcoin, Bitcoin is still emerging as money, not many people want to hold it yet. That's, that's the point. It's been emerging for 10 years. It's actually a money. It actually gets used quite a bit. Um, it, you know, some people not, imagine it being when used. You it even to, when, not when you compare it to most national currencies. Well, it's not. It doesn't compare to most national. Exchange. It doesn't compare to most national currencies because, again, it's not a white market money. If it became anywhere close to the size of, you know, major national currencies, it would no longer be legal. Well, Presumably, yeah, but, when yeah. when it starts taking that much tax revenue. Um, inflation tax and uh, taking away transparency from transactions, then it'll go away. So again, this yeah, is why I, I continue to, to emphasize black market money. I mean, it, that's not even it's not even comparing to a black market money or like money laundering and stuff. So it's all much bigger than the size of Bitcoin right now. More there's yeah, more well, money you, laundered you at, and stuff than Bitcoin is. If you look at the current price you know the speculation is that right now it bitcoin is is operating at somewhere around i don't know i i just to, totally ballparked it in the art, article i wrote cause it's not really about getting an exact number it's about the process but you're looking at speculation at the at the price of say ten thousand uh estimating that in in 10 years it will it will um it will control about 10 uh, about seven percent or seven or eight percent i forget what it was uh, of the uh black market the estimated size of the black market in 10 years. Um, the black market's about 20, 30% of the world's economy. So that's not small. Um, and how do, you get the, estimate, how do you get 7% uh, estimation? What is it based on? You just take the, the, the total amount of money in the world, uh, you know. Um, the base money? Or take the percentage, which, take which, which money, you, right? Not credit, the, money. <laughs> the circulating money or... Uh, all the circulating money, or which which money is that? Like uh, money, I mean, every money. I mean, okay. Uh, how much dollars is that? are money? Euros are money. Uh, you know, how many how many trillions you know, are we talking about? How many? Uh, I don't have the numbers in my head. It's all in the article I wrote. Um, okay, okay, okay. But it's you know it's it's trillions. It's but it's not you know M three for example. That's credit. Right? Mm. Credit expands on money based on time preference. And the expansion of credit on money is, is significant. And people make that error all the time saying, well, Bitcoin will just replace all credit, <laughs> which is ridiculous, right? I mean, if you're going to make a comparison, make it with money. It's not credit. Um, and uh, if you take the fraction of the uh, global economy that's estimated to be um, black market, then you just take the fraction of that amount of money. And now you have, um, you have the estimate of the amount of money that's used in the black market. And then just take, 
the current price and and uh, take the take the uh, future value of that price. Uh, um, you know, in ten years, and take the total amount of Bitcoin supply in ten years, and you know that's about what you come up with. Uh, again, these are these are really gross. Uh, the, the article I wrote are really gross. I'm trying to I'm trying to pull it up right now while I'm talking to you. Gross estimates. It's not about trying to get to an exact number, but showing like what's a rational process if you're trying to ballpark. You know what the price is. Uh, what are you actually speculating on? Um, then do this, and somebody could come up with much more precise numbers for these things than I did. But um, you know, it's in the ballpark. And what you're doing is you're looking at the current um, price uh, and projecting it forward. At, you know, up to like 10 years, and saying, well, what, what would the given the number of units that are out there at that point, how much of the how much of the black market market economy do we believe today? Um, that that will be using Bitcoin in say 10 years, and that's that's the that's the ballpark figure I came up with, seven percent or so, seven and a half percent. And could based be, on could that, could be 10, could be could be 20. But, you know. Okay, but okay, let's just say okay, let's just say it's seven percent. Uh, could you? Is it possible to derive the this future um, uh, you know price per Bitcoin well, then uh, in 10 years based on on those estimations? Well. Yeah, that's implied in the estimate. Um, just what is project that? it forward. What is that projected? Uh, you're you're asking me to make projections, and I this article is about a process for determining. You know, if you if you wanted to if you wanted to use a rational method for coming up with some estimate of what what we're speculating on, this is it. But but actual predict. You know, I'm not going to predict prices. Okay. Um, uh, and that's why I purposely use very loose numbers, just so you know. It's just a process, but it was really meant to show the invalidity of the various techniques that people have used. Like, you know, okay, Bitcoin will be this much because we're put, because we're, we're assuming it's going to replace M3, which is not only all money, it's all bank credit, right? But it's not even all credit. That's, that's what's, <laughs> that's what's strange. It's just some intermediate credit value. Um, so that, that, that's just not, there's no rational basis for that. Um, hold on. So maybe you can see if I can pull it up. If you give me just a second. Sure. I was actually trying to pull up the, uh, the Rothbard definition for time preference, um, but I'll pull this up now. It's fine. I'm all distracted. Um, yeah, so you could, people have used all these different estimates, you know, tangible money, base money, which is money. Uh, bank credit, which is M3 minus M0, or just M3, all credit, bank credit, debt, equity, gross domestic product, you know, all these things have been, been used. But um, what I did is I took the U.S. base money, which is Fed obligations, printed and yet to be printed dollar accounting, and um, took the fraction of the global economy that is the U.S. economy based on market capitalization, which is about 40%. Now that's, that could be done much better. You just go add up all the currencies in the world, you know, all the monies in the world, do it differently. But I just took this really gross estimate and said, okay, the, the U.S. market is 40% of global markets. Okay, so the take the U.S. Uh, base money and you know, multiply it by one over 40%. Um, then you take the amount of Bitcoin that would exist in the future, and then you project forward um, growth, uh, you know, net present value. Uh, uh, yeah, so the opportunity cost of speculating over a 10 year term, in other words, you're not investing, you're speculating. Right, so if you're investing, you'd be get, you'd be earning, say t say I think I used a conservative 7.2 percent. Typically, the global return on capital is around 10 percent, but use a conservative 7.2 percent opportunity cost for for uh, for not investing during that term, and so that 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 implies you expect that you're going to make uh, at least that much um, on your speculation. Um, so project that forward 10 years, uh, you get a doubling of the uh, doubling of the price. Um, so base money, what's the price at 527.16, 
uh, yeah, the, the topic's called price estimation. It's in my, it's in my wiki. Mm -hmm. So you take a replacement of all money uh, and then take 28% of that, which is the global market and the base money. Uh, so 100% replacement for estimated black market trade, uh, the price would be $73,000 today at 100% black market replacement. $73,000, right? It, so take, take, um, take what the current price is. And so therefore the, the current projection, the, the presumption is that the, uh, the current price is estimating a, in 10 years that the uh, black market adoption will be 7.4%. But again, really gross numbers is just meant to show the process. So that's the gross uh, estimation. If you take 7% of the black market. The if you're speculating now, right, on future growth yeah. in yeah. say 10 years, and you're suffering an opportunity cost of 7.2% on your speculation, which means you're betting that you're gonna make at least 7.2%, which is you know, a conservative return on capital. Then the amount that, the price that you're expecting in the future comes out to 7.4% of the black market. Um, if you assume it's 28% of the global market and you assume that the world, the world amount of money is, um, uh, US money is 40% of the world's money, which is probably not quite accurate, but um, again, just an estimate. So, mm -hmm. yeah. If you have seven, if you have seven and a half percent of the, uh, the black market in 10 years, and the price seems, you know, according to those assumptions would make sense. Of all, you know, all like talking about all activity, but of course having, if, if Bitcoin's black market money and you have um, the white market is obviously something else, Bitcoin can't be all the money used in the black market, right? Uh, because people can't get stuff in the white market. That's what money laundering is, right? Getting your, getting your black market money into white market money. So there's clearly um, not complete, uh, over uh, isolation there of the two monies. Um, but it, it, you know, it's, it's used like that today. There's, there's plenty of black market activity that happens in Bitcoin and people uh, exchange out of that into dollars. I mean, it's I, the example I always use is, you know, why, why are there ATMs outside of all the strip clubs, right? People take their, people take their debit cards and credit cards. They go, they get some cash, they go in and they spend some dollars, some euros, whatever. And then they, then they take it home, maybe put it back in the bank, right? <laughs> whatever they have left. There's a reason people use these different monies in different scenarios. Um, there's a reason people use credit cards, it's dollars, you know, coins, uh, whatever. Um, and Bitcoin has a particular value proposition and it has a particular, it has one that, that threatens revenue uh, by the state, which is not uh, presumably going to be given up. Um, so, building things that assume, you know, permission to me are not really that incredibly productive and, and, and speculating on a money that's just used as a speculative vehicle doesn't also doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, so anyway, that was, you know, it was uh, just a few comments I made, but did all kinds of other stuff started coming out like time preference and have to knock those down one at a time. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely see why you're you're saying it's it's black market money. I most at least mostly agree, if not completely agree, because um, I I do think there will be some uh, white market use, but I think the black market is by far its greatest use of Bitcoin. Um, honestly, that's why I love uh, BISC, for example. Um, but yeah, so I st but I still think holding it does make sense if, if you expect it to grow. At least, you know. Yeah, if you, if you know it's gonna grow, you should hold it. <laughs> That's, but it's called speculation for a reason. You don't know, because if everybody knew, the price would just be higher, and then it would be fully speculated. The question is, when is that? It's hard to know, right? I mean, speculation isn't a bet, isn't a bet that the price is going up. Speculation is a bet that the current price is wrong, mm -hmm. right? That people haven't mm -hmm. priced in that knowledge yet. Well, exactly. when is it all priced in? How do we know? The only way to know is when the actual utility of the money uh, is expressed. Right? Um, and that does happen. Yeah, so speculation yeah, is the realistic yeah. demand, the realistic expectation of, a, of an uncertain event or uncertain 
uh, growth uh, potential in the future, which I haven't calculated in right now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's speculation is always speculation on utility, right? There's usefulness of everything that people want and have, right? Money, if you have a pure money, a fiat money, um, which means no use value, you can't make it into jewelry, you can't, um, you know, smoke it, whatever. It's, it's, just, it's just used for trade then the only utility is in trading it for other stuff. And speculation is always on utility. And, it, and inherently speculation is what's not known, right? What's known is already in the price, right? What people, what, what you know, the, the price is the market's current best estimation of the utility for the future, but it can be completely wrong, right? Um, utility itself has to be expressed at some point. So, um, you know, the speculators will speculate above and a speculate above, below utility, and they, they always do. Um, that's a zero sum game, right? Somebody takes the, takes takes one side of the bet. Like for example, in Bitcoin, people speculating on Bitcoin is pe people taking the other bet, which is holding dollars, right? And one win, one wins, one loses. It's not a it's not like production investment, which is a positive sum game. It's just a zero sum game. It's no net increase in utility or or value. Um, you know, if there was only one money, it was just Bitcoin and people are buying, you know, speculating above, other people are clearly speculating below what the utility is. So there, there's no, they're just guessing. There's no reason to believe that they have better knowledge of what the utility is or will be than the people who actually use it, right? Um, so it doesn't even help the price get anywhere. It just moves it around. <laughs> and I, I, I'll take the time at, uh, when we're done to pull up um, you know, Rothbard's uh, explanations of these concepts, which are, which are pretty clear. Um, I'm not just making this stuff up. I usually, I mean, I do make a lot of stuff up, but, but this is, this is just stuff that's, you know, <laughs> right out of the textbooks. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I really try to avoid referencing things like that. It's just appeal to authority, but um, the proofs are in there and um, you know, I, I'm not going to read them back. So um, I can refer people to them. Uh, before I want yeah. you know. mm -hmm. to ask something yeah, so, about Menger and Mises, but uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead, Ben? And yeah, so what I see as the utility of money is not is is as a medium of exchanges. It's a settlement, basically a settlement asset which you can sell or trade with. That yeah. exactly goes medium to of cash exchange. balances. Yeah, that's go, but that goes to cash balances basically, not just circulation. I mean, you're. I think you're focusing well, only on the circulation aspect of money, but it, well, all, but you it just, also is the, the cash balances. Those two things you said are the same thing. Settlement is trade, right? That, that's when when you pay somebody for something and they give you the stuff. The trade is settled. If you lend somebody something and they eventually pay you back, it's settled. If you if you lend a bank your money and then you take it out of the ATM, that's settlement. Right, settlement is when the, the there's no more debt, right? When mm -hmm. the debt is relieved. Yeah, so all, all trades, all trades, all loans are settled. Um, so saying it's for settlement but not for trade doesn't really make any sense. And that sounds like what you're saying online before. What I'm saying is that it's it's by saying it's settlement, I mean it's for increasing cash balances. It allows you to increase your cash balances in Bitcoin. Well, yeah, Bitcoin allows you to hold Bitcoin, but that's Self-evident, right? I mean, dollars allow you to hold dollars. Um, it doesn't allow you to increase your cash balance. You have to actually earn some money to do that, right? It, it's just the money. No, you can no, hold it, you yeah. can spend it, but you know. Yes, but I mean, the demand is not only to to spend it to let it circulate. It's also to save it in for use later, basically. That's but I'm that's saying. an expectation of spending. Right. So it's always spending. And this is, again, another pure Austrian concept. Um, Mises said it, Rothbard said it. Money is just a medium of exchange. Everything else is a consequence of that. You know, and I always tell people you can't store yes. value. You can only store stuff yeah, you, and stuff may or may not have value in the future when you can trade it with somebody. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. But when you basically when you hold it, you yeah, you expect to, uh, to spend it, of course. Um, yeah, everything is expe yeah. an expectation of, of trading. 
yeah, but you're expecting to, to trade it. Basically, why you're saving it is you expect to trade it with something which is not currently avail available on the market for a certain deal which you want to make, which is not available mm -hmm. right now on the market. If, if it was yeah. available right now on the market, you would do it now. Well, it is and available on the market often. And what, what you're doing is, is, you're, is you're speculating on the price that you'll be able to, to get it for. Right. You want to buy a house. Well, the houses, you think the housing prices are going to go down. So you hold some money for a while and the prices go up and you say, well, screw it up. Buy yeah. it anyway. Right. Yeah. So what, yeah, but what you're doing is you're waiting for the house to be at a price where you want to buy it. Basically it's currently available yep. on the market, but not at a certain price. So what you're doing is that's, just waiting for it to reach a certain price. That's right. And uh, everybody else is yeah. making the same decisions and the current price reflects the set of all those decisions. So the current price is the only right price, right? Because there is no right price. It's just, uh, I know that didn't make any sense, but uh, you know, price is just what people are willing to trade for. And a speculator yeah. argues that, well, he knows better than the rest of the market. Um, and maybe he does have market, you know, inf information that's not perfect, but you know, the efficient market hypothesis has been tested many times and it seems to hold up pretty well. Um, so, you know, if, if people believed right now that Bitcoin was actually going to be worth, you know, what is, what, what's the, what's the claim? $50,000 in a, in a, in a couple months, they'd be paying a lot more for it right now. They don't actually believe it, right? They're waiting to see it. Um, because if they did believe it, the price would already be there. So, you know, the market yeah. price, is the price and people can guess above and below all they want um but it's always speculation on the ability to trade it for something it's always about you know exchange mm Uh, would you elaborate a little bit? I know you talked about this. Uh, what's your take on this? Um, you know, this, this, the, the core of Bitcoin, uh, the core principle is that about the absolute scarcity with 21 million. What effect does that have? I mean, what, what's, what, what is that in relation to everything? What effect does it have? Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just want me to talk about scarcity because yes. Bitcoin is the most scarce. What's yes. your tagline there? Yeah, yeah. Say My it. heart is as hard as the scarcest money ever created. Yes. All right, all right. I just okay. wanted to hear it. If you yeah, let's it, you hear it because it's beginning. for everybody because everybody's saying it. So, you know, uh, uh, must, must be something. I mean, otherwise, what's the use if, if it's, you know, if, if it doesn't have any effect, monetary effect? Its use is that it's permissionless, not that it's hard, right? I mean, hard doesn't even have a clear definition. People look at the history of a money, like a dollar, and they say, well, it's, you know, it's got this amount of hardness. It's much better than the Zimbabwe dollar. It's much, much harder. But what makes it harder? Nothing, just people's choices, right? Um, the history of a money does not determine its future. Right? And so you look at like the inflation rate of the dollar and what, you presume that it's always going to be that way? That's the measure of its hardness? No, it could be much softer than that, right? Uh, if we use that definition of hardness. And this idea of gold being hard, gold is produced at the rate that people demand it. The more, the more demand, the more production. Um, and the only exceptions are, you know, some discovery of say the Comstock load, which leads to a supply shock, you know, in other words, it gets dramatically cheaper to produce it, but that's not the normal case, right? It's really not been the case with gold, for example, where, and it's not the case with anything else. Um, you know, typically when people, when more people want, when there's more demand for something, more gets made. And gold gets produced at about the rate of growth in the economy, right? Economic growth, say two two percent or so. That's about it's, the rate of production okay. of gold. Uh, now that's important, uh, Eric. Let me let me ask you this. Okay, it's uh, the inflation rate of gold is <laughs> approximately one to two percent per year, but there's a maximum that can be reached. As you said, I mean, uh, what if they uh, if if technology or the resources are there, or we find something, I don't know, underneath the oceans. Uh, you, you have to put time, energy, and resources into it. Uh, in okay, to... okay, but, but every, everything gets produced based on demand or expected demand, right? Entrepreneurs go out and they, they assume that somebody's gonna, there's going to be some demand and they, they make the stuff before that demand materializes a lot of times. But let's, let's just assume initially 
there's no change in technology, right? There's the same technological, you know, same tools being used to produce the gold year over year over year. And there's economic growth. Growth is a, is a difference between interest, which is the net of production, and depreciation, which is the loss of stuff over time due to consumption, right? So you take interest minus depreciation, you get growth. And so interest, say, roughly around 10% typically. Depreciation must be around 6 or 7 8% because you get growth around 2%, right? Um, and so growth, by the way, is that number that people, when people look at a deflationary money or a fixed supply money, they assume constant increase in purchasing power. Well, assuming Bitcoin is the only money in the world, then, then the growth in purchasing power would be strictly a consequence of the growth in production of the economy. Of course, if nobody's lending it, there's no production. So, so uh, there wouldn't be any growth and there wouldn't be any growth in the money. But um, the, the growth then you would assume would be around 2% per year growth in Bitcoin, which means it would always make sense to lend it because interest would be around 10%, right? And again, if nobody lent it, there'd be no interest, no, no growth. So let's, let's say the, the, econ the world economy, used, we have a gold economy, the world economy is growing at say 2%. Well, there's two, what, what the assumption people make when they say fixed supply uh, is, you know, creates a deflationary money, the assumption they're making is that the money relation is changing. The ratio, uh, the ratio of the amount of money, the, the units of it, and the amount of stuff demanded in it, right? I need the money because I want to buy stuff with it. Um, it's a medium for me to get anything else I want to get, right? So that growth is economic growth, and that supply is the supply of, say, gold. Well, when, so, the, so people accept that assumption when they say gold, Bitcoin is a deflationary money. Okay, so they can't reject it elsewhere. And what happens with production of anything aside from Bitcoin, um, nothing else is fixed supply. And I, I, I think I would more, uh, more finely argue the point that Bitcoin's really not either, but we'll set that aside, right? When you, when you look at something like gold, and assuming no technological changes, gold should be Gold is going to increase in demand at about 2% per year if there's no increase in supply. So what happens? The price of gold rises. Now you can produce it for profit. Now people start doing it because they can make more than the interest rate. They can make profit, which is the return on capital above the cost of capital. So they, you know, competition comes in, they mind it, they make more. Well, what are they doing? There's this new demand, right? There's new demand for, 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 for stuff to mine the gold. Right? That stuff's being destroyed in order to produce the gold. So you've got an increase in demand for stuff, and now you have an increase in supply as well. Right? And the stuff is not being invested, so you're also consuming the opportunity cost. So the full amount of the new gold has been, is a consequence of new demand. So there's no change in the money relation. You have new gold, you have new demand, and the gold price will come down to the original price over time because you've created new supply and the and, and new demand, right? So the money, ratio, the money relation doesn't change. New gold being produced, just like new cars, new anything, is not inflationary. Unless there's some technological improvement or some new discovery that allows you to produce it more cheaply. Um, but in order, if it's, if it's more cheap to produce gold, it's more cheap to produce everything, right? So that, that, that I mean, Assuming, right? This is another another generalization. But if but if technology is improving things uniformly, then there's still going to be no change in the money relation, right? Um, the ratio is not going to change. So there has to be a disproportionate change in the efficiency of producing the gold for it to be inflationary, for the for there to actually be um, a reduction in the purchasing power of it. And of course, that does happen. I mean, the Comstock load discovery was a great example. It just became much cheaper to produce silver and the, the, the purchasing power of silver was depressed for a long, long time. Um, so with, with Bitcoin, new, new supply never has that problem because new supply is always adjusted for the current cost, right? So whenever you produce more, it costs whatever the current price is. You have to consume that amount of energy, you have to destroy that amount of capital in order to in order to produce Bitcoin. So the new supply, just like the new supply of gold, is always inflation neutral, it doesn't cause any change. So the idea that you know the reduction in supply, right? The reduction in the rate of the issuance of new Bitcoin somehow makes it more valuable is just incorrect. 
right? It just, it doesn't have any effect on it as it shouldn't, right? The, and, and just like the introduction of new gold doesn't have any effect on the price of gold. So this idea that there's this, there's this increasing price because we're reducing the rate of inflation is just incorrect. The new, new Bitcoin is not inflationary. Um, however, once you get to the point where you're not producing any new Bitcoin, right? You have a fixed supply in that one chain um, and assuming it's the only money and you have increasing demand because of economic growth, because everybody's lending their Bitcoin and making stuff, then you'll have a growth um, a purchasing power in the coin of about 2% a year, right? That, that, that you can assume, but those are some pretty big assumptions in there. Um, there's no reason to believe, I mean, there's, there's actually no rationale whatsoever to think it would be any higher than the rate of economic growth, right? So the people who say you can't ever lend a deflationary money because it earns more than interest. Well, it doesn't, it can't, right? Interest always has to be greater than growth um, by the amount of depreciation. So the only case where that's not true is when you have a recession where interest is actually less than growth, I mean, less than depreciation. So you're actually depreciating, you're destroying more capital than you're producing. It's your classic socialist state, right? It's consuming capital. It's actually not producing more and eventually it has to actually start producing. So interest rates rise, you know, or people start extending the lifetime of their stuff. Depreciation slows until you actually have growth. Um, so recession is a very exceptional scenario where something's gone wrong, right? Uh, because typically people want stuff. They don't want to have nothing, which is what you'll have with perpetual recession. Um, so interest rates will rise until the point where it becomes becomes uh, worth actually producing stuff for people because they're willing to buy it, and that's why interest rates are rising. Uh, anyway, so that's just the long winded way of saying, yeah, you can always lend any money um, and the expected inflation rate, uh, expected deflation rate of a fixed supply money, assuming it's the only money, is, uh, is the rate of economic growth and new production of new money or new anything, barring technological changes, is not inflationary. Summary points. Mm -hmm. Uh, can, can I ask you something about gold? Because there was this discussion or uh, during your presentation in Riga where you said a certain percentage is used at jewelry. And I don't know about the industrial usage. This is my, my question. Is the, does the demand of, the, of this whatever one, two percent yearly of gold production uh, come from the industrial usage or industrial demand or where does it come from? You can't, you can't split that out. I mean, it, it's just demand, but the usage of gold um, is more than, it's right around 50%, maybe 51% goes to jewelry every year. And I think a couple guys on the panel disagree with that. And there was a guy in the back of the audience that yelled, no, it's not, you know? And it turns out he contacted me later and he gave a presentation later at Riga about that very subject. And he said, I was absolutely correct. And I knew I was correct, I've read it um, many times. And, so it's uh, really 51% um, jewelry? Is that really? Is that, I thought it yeah, was much less. It's not hard to find. Oh, right. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, okay. And then you get, you get a much, much, much smaller percentage that's actually industrial use. Mm -hmm. um, so when states hoard money, they don't hoard their own paper, right? Because they have the ability to print as much as they want. So no other state will take it in time of war or need or anything like that, right? They don't want their own paper because they can just print as much as they want. And they don't want somebody else's paper for the same reason. So they have to hoard something else, right? So why do they hoard gold? Well, um, gold's value is, it, it, it's, gold has use value, right? So it's not just, you know, at least half, more than half, well, you know, well more than half of the, of the uses of, of gold right now that of new gold produced is, is use value, not monetary value. Um, so there's this presumption that you know, it will always have some value because it's not just based on, it's not, it's not fiat. It's not like Bitcoin. And it's not like dollars. It's not just based on what anybody's willing to trade for it. I mean, ultimately the same is true of jewelry, right? Um, but it has actual use value. You could take it out of the vault and make your own jewelry with it. If you wanted, you'd be perfectly happy. Ben, what's your, what's your take? Do you argue? Are you arguing? Um... No, here, here I, I guess I mostly agree. So I do think there is a monetary premium even on jewelry and stuff. So I do think it's 
even, even the use of gold as jewelry is at least in some places uh, I heard some uh, like Indian stuff so it is used even even if it's in a form of jewelry as money in certain cases but yeah I yep. generally agree well you, you have to understand that's true of all things right um, in Venezuela they use uh, you know uh, stereos and TVs as money. <laughs> they store store electronics, even though they depreciate pretty rapidly. They depreciate a lot slower than than the Venezuelan boulevard, the new boulevard. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah everything that, has some aspect of monetary use. It, it's not really an exception. People store their value in different ways, or you know, to the extent that value can be stored. Right? They store their capital that they expect to spend later in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, people people do it with cars. They do it with houses. They do it with artwork, you know, all kinds of things. Basically anything you have that you don't expect to fully consume, you assume you can liquidate and, and get other stuff for. And that and gold is just an efficient way to do that, but um, it's really not unique to gold. So yeah, separating I, I out. I didn't say it's of, unique to gold. I'm not saying it's unique to gold, but it's, yeah. I mean, most things, my computer doesn't have much uh, monitor premium, I guess. And um, maybe it would if we were in a um, a hyperinflation case here, but for now it doesn't. Yeah, I mean the benefit of gold is it's something with use value that doesn't it doesn't decay very rapidly, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it has a carry cost um, like everything else, but it's very compact um, and it doesn't uh, depreciate very rapidly. The depreciation of gold is, is essentially the uh, the demurrage, the, the cost of securing it. And the opportunity cost of not lending it, but that's that's a different type of cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ben, what do else you got, Kevin? <laughs> how, how much is how much is going to owe me for this? <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, uh, <laughs> can uh, we put we, a number on that? No, I no, I don't. I don't. One Bitcoin. To, I don't want to be attacked. <laughs> I don't want to be attacked. Um, <laughs> Take some risk, man. Are we over one hour, or have we done an hour or so? I think so. Yeah. So, Ben, uh, do you have any other questions, or do you have uh, like any counter arguments discussion? Um, regarding so your... not 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 on the recent like on the recent takes. I still like what I'm saying is that I still think the use of money for as like holding it as cash balances is a valid is a valid use. I mean, of course, it's much better, like it's a lower time preference activity to lend it or invest it. But I still think that in order to adopt Bitcoin, we should uh, also desire it in our cash balances. Um, and as more people want it, they will be more willing to accept it. And it will actually be able to circulate. That's that's my argument. Yes, yeah, my take is that it's always held by someone. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of a tautological, right? All property is held by somebody. So the question is, what are we gonna do with it? Okay, but, yeah, but it, it just depends on how many, I guess, uh, hold it. Yeah. Well, people. if we take the same amount of money and we divide it by a million people or a thousand people, it doesn't imply any different uh, value. Um, well, it, the, it value, the value is going to come. Effects, basically. It implies but there's no if, network. I mean, if, a mil, if a million people use certain money, it's much more useful than if a thousand people use it. Well, well, you say use, something's implied, you know, trading, right? If, if they just hold it, right? If you have a million people holding it or you have a thousand people holding it, it makes no difference. Everybody's just holding it. It has no price even. Um, if you have, if you have one person holding it and, you know, millions of people accepting it, right, it has real value to that person, right? Uh, say one person holds most of the gold, right? If nobody accepts it, it's worth nothing. If lots of people accept it, it's worth a lot. Um, so it, it's not a function of how many people hold it. It's a function of how many people will accept it, which is people who want to hold it, right? But if nobody is accepting it, yes. it's not, I mean, you can't buy much with it. It's not worth much, right? Um, and yeah, so I, I this, guess, the network so is between merchants, not between hodlers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but um, not really because hodlers also accept it, or most hodlers will well, accept it. Well, when they accept they it, they're merchants. It. <laughs> yeah, when when they're a, accepting it, they're merchants. If they're not accepting it, they're not, they're not securing it, right? Because they don't have any say in the consensus mm -hmm. rules. 
and mm -hmm. they're not they're not providing part of the network of people that will trade for it right so they're not they're not actually providing value to people who have it um, the idea of everybody just holding it and therefore it's way valuable is is, is kind of silly right? no, only, you have to use it. it of course you have to like to, to use it to spend it um, that's I guess yeah. that's obvious, but you can't, I, I guess but you can't spend it if nobody accepts it that you're spending it Okay. Yeah, okay. No, I get it. I get yeah, it. Okay. That's I, circular, uh, yes. Okay. I get it. Okay. So my question is: once the this I call it a transactional or the you know uh, um, buying and selling, just you know, really simply uh, the Lightning Network, the transactional ecosystem is is really much more developed. Do you think it will then, because of the usability of the easiness of use, uh, um, will facilitate and accelerate the demand? Exactly what we're talking about, Eric. What will what will increase and accelerate the demand, and and accepting as a trading trading values. Yeah, if it's, it's easier to use in the in the scenarios where it will actually be usable, I think it will increase its. I mean, it does. That implies it has higher utility, right? It's easier to use. I mean, people people assume that there's like no alternatives, right? Like people can't use anything else; they just have to use Bitcoin. But but there's tons of alternatives to Bitcoin. And there's some that are very similar to Bitcoin and people will use those alternatives to the extent that they're cheaper for them in their scenario. Right. I mean, you know, there's not a, there's not a Bitcoin ATM out in front of the strip clubs, right? It's not very useful. Like nobody's taking it. You can't throw it on the floor or whatever. Right? So th th there's all these, there's, there's just cases where it's useful and there's cases where it's not. And the easier you can make it, presumably it's more useful in more scenarios, the more private you can make it. I think, I mean, to me, that's the most important thing that uh, that mm -hmm. core development is working on. Uh, you know, ease of use is basically what I work on, right? The Bitcoin is a library for people to, and it's not, we're not innovating new privacy tech, not really. But some people have contributed some stuff, but, but I, I just wait for that stuff to come along and then we incorporate it into, into the library so people can build stuff more easily. Um, that's real Bitcoin stuff, not, you know, using some web API that's, you know, running you know, that tens of thousands or millions of people's wallets, um, basically one merchant in the, in the, in the graph, right? Um, it's, you want, you want a lot of people to, you want people to accept it individually with their own, with their own control over the cons consensus rules. Um, and the easier you can make that, I mean, Casa's doing good work in the space, you know, I, I think you know, Trezor, those guys as well, it's, those are important things. You need your, be able to run your own stuff easily as possible and uh um what about the coin joining the and you world, need, you need privacy, world right? privacy yeah. yeah so this is right. because the scenarios where bitcoin is, i mean it's permissionless right if it's if it's not private it's not permissionless right um so that that's those are the two important areas where you know i think all real core development is focused and i think yeah it's great um other stuff i don't find very valuable you know, basically driving adoption into white market, you know, institutions and centralizing APIs and things like that. They're, they're just counterproductive, right? And they give this appearance of value. Uh, and then people speculate on that appearance. Um, you know, to me, the price is, is not the, the critical thing in Bitcoin. It, it implies use, but if the use is easily wiped out, it's just a charade. Uh, if the price is permissioned, I should say, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it'll 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 get there one way or the other. You know, I'm not worried about that. That's why I work on it. I don't, I'm not negative on Bitcoin. I just I just think people should understand that. If people understood some of these things a little better, then we'd waste less time. Mm -hmm. right? Less capital would flow into stuff. Uh, that, that's kind of pointless. Risk-free lending. It's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> um, getting rid of you know fractional reserve um getting rid of credit expansion uh you know risk-free lending all the there's all these these banking fallacies that drive a lot of attention and, and capital and it's just wasted um so yeah that's really why I, I focus on these topics i just want people to to invest in the things that make sense ben what's your take on that yeah, I again, I mostly agree. I do see um, 
use for Bitcoin even in the white market. Um, maybe not as not as much. So I wouldn't say that it's counterproductive to, to build uh, stuff also for the white market. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it can be. Uh, maybe I will be wrong about that, but I don't think it will completely uh, vanish from the white market eventually. I still think it will circulate even in the white market. Well, if it's illegal, it won't, because by definition, it'll be black market, and all that takes yeah, is I, a I, law. That's, so. Yeah, so there's <laughs> no, but there's different between illegal and restricted. Um, that's that's what I think. I don't I don't make that fine point if it's if it's restricted what what the part that is restricted is illegal for example people say people people believe they can avoid signage with Bitcoin they can hodl their Bitcoin and never pay the inflation tax let's just say the let's just say the dollar I mean say they're American the dollar drops you know by half um, they just got a a hundred percent capital gains tax right? <laughs> or they just got a capital gains tax when they go to use their Bitcoin, right? When they send, when they spend it, um, they're going to have to take the dollar value of whatever they spend it on, subtract their basis, and they're going to have to pay a tax on that. That tax is signage, right? They're not avoiding it unless they break that law, right? And I'm not encouraging them to do so, mind you, but I'm just suggesting that it's already illegal to get that benefit. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not the full amount, right? If signage would be 100% of that, the tax is going to be whatever the percentage of the capital gain is, maybe 20, 30, 40%, um, 50%, maybe if you're in California or New York. Um, but it's still, you're paying it. Now well, people are getting, I got, I, got a, I got a letter from the IRS. I actually got two uh, telling, them, telling me that they know I have Bitcoin and I may owe a tax, right? Um, and... Uh, then I got kicked off of Coinbase for who knows what reason. I just, I had it for like six years. I just had a, you know, a dollar cost average going and they just said, no, you're too risky. I guess. I don't know. They didn't tell me why. Um, so it's not like these things. I mean, Coinbase doesn't care, right? They don't want to kick people off who are buying Bitcoin. Um, that's being driven by law and they're, and they're um, probably their automated process. is trying to figure out what the risk is for them being, you know, being determined to be money laundering. Um, so there's a, there's some kind of assumption that these things aren't already, you know, issues, but they are, um, you know, all the, the on ramps and off ramps are all being targeted and that's just the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of already there. Uh, you know, I always tell people we're still in the honeymoon honeymoon phase because kind of, you can do a lot of stuff publicly with Bitcoin. Um, but, um, yeah, and kind of ignoring some big stuff that's already there. So do you think this process of, is it going to clamp down? Like it's going to become a much more strict, much more enforceable, or I don't know, they're going really to... It's very, it's very enforceable. That's, that's not, you know, maybe, maybe you just misspoke, but it's, it's, you know, always enforceable. The question is um, to what extent do they want to do it? And I don't make predictions about, you know, when things will happen. Um, or even if they'll happen, just that if they want to, if it becomes, if Bitcoin becomes valuable enough, presumably somebody will care. In other words, if it's got enough utility, it's really saving people tax money. Like they're not paying, you know, when the, when the, you know, Nick, then when the, when the Zimbabwe bond notes start going to zero again, you know, they, they renamed them. They were the dollar for the last four iterations. So now they're bond notes. And uh, I bought one and I'm waiting for it to go to zero. It only cost me a dollar. Um, bought it in the Zimbabwe bank. Uh, and I asked one of the local guys, I said, he said, I said, I said, what's going to happen with this? And he, and he put up his hands and he went, he went like this. And I was like, ah, oh, he, he gets it. Right. He knows what they're doing. So when, when that happens, you know, uh, um, I'll, uh, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be ready. Cash out my Zimbabwe dollar in time. Um, but yeah, these, these things, when that when that happens and everybody starts using Bitcoin in Zimbabwe, what are they going to do? No, they might do nothing. They might just el eliminate their ability to tax via the money. <laughs> they did just say, ah, we give up. We, we we've been doing this for you know five iterations now under one dictator, but but uh, I guess he's gone now. But um, you know they they do have that option to just surrender their taxing ability through the money. 
uh, and their ability to see what everybody's doing, you know, assuming decent privacy. But presumably, if they care, they will they will do the easiest thing, which is to sign a piece of paper and say you can't do this unless you make these rule changes, which make it the ideal state money, uh, which defeats the value proposition. At that point, anybody who accepts it is a money launderer, including miners. Um, that's very easy to do, and it's very easy to enforce in the white market, right? Because the white market doesn't resist. They're the ones that accept the law. So forcing it in the black market is a different story. And as you probably know, the next step is go to a 51% attack. If you, if you have enough willpower, it's really not that expensive because it's profitable. So you, you move into a profitable regime of mining and run a, you know, effect, I mean, effectively, that's all a soft work is, right? It's 51% attack. If a miner enforced soft work, just refusing to build on other blocks that don't, don't honor the restrictions. So, um, you know, and, and people have achieved that. So it's very doable. Um, and if the, if the economy, if the, if the black market economy wants to pay for, you know, higher hash rate, um, that's mining unapproved transactions, uh, unauthorized transactions, then, then Bitcoin can survive that. So that's not, not really knowable. All right. All right, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Ben. Did you want to have? Uh, did you want to say something in conclusion, or um, comments? No. No. I I just think Bitcoin. I hope I hope it will. Um, so, I mean, a lot, a lot of this this talk is somewhat pessimistic, but I think I want to make it clear that I do think Bitcoin can survive that. I guess Eric think like that too and that's why he works on the Bitcoin. Exactly. I just want to make this clear. Um yeah, he's a realist. He he's a realist. Eric is a realist. He's, <laughs> he's rationalist. A realist. rationalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. No, we're really so, thankful, yeah. Eric, for your, you know, really rigid, uh, logical, rational elaborations. And, I think you, and I think you for putting up with me all, all the I think you for putting up with me all the time, Kevin. <laughs> No, I, it's, I mean, it's, what it is, it's almost it's almost four in the morning over here, so you know, um, I get a little punchy. <laughs> what are you drinking? Are you drinking beer right now to go to sleep, or a juice? Pale ale. Oh, pale ale. Very healthy. Very healthy. Yeah, Washington Trails. So, Eric, are you going to be at the Lightning Conference in Berlin? You don't. No. Okay. No. Let's see. Let's see you next time. Then. All right. Well, I'll see you, Ben, in Berlin. And uh, thank you so much for this discussion. I learned so much and my listeners, viewers, uh, hopefully will trigger some discussion. A lot of people will, will feel triggered. I already see that, but it's okay. It's mm -hmm. part of the process. Yeah. <laughs> nice meeting you, Ben. Yeah, nice meeting you too. Thanks for the discussion and no. thanks for having me. Thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.